Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Ashley's freshly back from a weekend in Vegas. A few other people are as well. We're so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here is John Schnepp. I'm freshly back from a weekend with all the sweaties at WonderCon. What's up, man? <laughs> also here, kind of alive, is Jeremy Johns. Vegas, baby. <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> also, here's Christian Harloff. Well, oh, thanks for that nice intro. And also, here's uh, Christian Harloff. Christian Thank Harloff. you guys for everyone that was at WonderCon, came out to the Schmodown panel. It was a lot of fun. And yes, people have been tweeting the panel will be on the channel uh, soon. We just don't know when. Yeah, probably within the next couple of days, maybe even later today. I, I don't know. We'll find out. But it'll be there, there soon. All right. We got a whole bunch of stuff going on in the world of movies. <laughs> Ashley, start us off. A new trailer has been released for Universal's first movie in a shared universe of monsters with The Mummy. Directed by Alex Kurtzman, the movie stars Sofia Boutella as an ancient princess who is suddenly awakened in present day, unleashing her terror on the modern world with only Tom Cruise and the way to stop her. Russell Crowe also stars as the infamous Dr. Henry Jekyll, serving as the bridge to the universe, a la Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury in the MCU. The movie is written by Mission Impossible 6 director Christopher McQuarrie and Passengers writer John Spates, and is set to open in theaters on June 9th. John, what do you think of the new trailer for The Mummy? You know what? I really like this trailer. I, I thought the first one was intriguing, and that, that's neat and everything. I have not known what to think about this whole universal, like, monster-shared universe thing for a while. They started adding big, huge names to it. It's like, oh, wow, they're taking this seriously. But this trailer is the one for me that has officially got me excited for it. I thought this was a very well put together. Look, it's it, the movie might end up being a hot mess, yes. But the trailer, at least, uh, and they used uh, the painted black thing again. And it that's an overused song, for sure. But for me, it worked in the trailer. That opening sequence, like showing how they discover the mummy in the first place, some kind of military operation, I thought that looked great. Then they tied in some of the material from the first trailer with some new stuff in there. It's got me, if the job of a trailer is to get you excited for a movie, then full marks to this trailer because it got me excited. I wasn't excited for this movie until now. So yeah, I, I'm big on it. What about you? I'm with you. I really liked it. I thought that what the first trailer did was that it just basically hooked you, got your interest going, oh, I'd be interested in seeing a little bit more of that. And then they give you a little bit more with this trailer. And I thought that it delivered. And I think that, it, you know, when you think about The Mummy, you do think about the Brendan Fraser movies and they purposely went a little bit more campy with those movies. This is clearly not that. There's, there's some horror elements to this thing. And I like the way that they're they're kind of connecting with Russell Crowe and to see where that character is going to go and how he's going to link. I thought it was intriguing also with the uh, the Sam Jackson kind of reference that um, I guess Riley said in the beginning he'll be kind of linking everyone together. I like that. I thought this was good. I love Sofia Boutella. Um, everything that she's been in so far, the limited stuff, I've loved her in. So I'm glad to see that she's going to be kind of the centerpiece for the most part of the, the antagonist. So Schnell. I like it. Yeah, Tom Cruise, have you heard of the Universal Monsters Initiative? That's it. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I guess if you have to have somebody link them together, uh, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, it makes sense, you know. Um, I, I, I love this trailer. I love the idea of the Universal Monsters starting out with the mummy. I didn't think the Dracula t movie really worked, so. <laughs> no, this, they, uh, they just swept that movie yeah, under the rug. That, 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 untold, twice baked, whatever it was this called. This is the first know? one. Yeah, yeah, this is the first one, and it looks really great. I mean, you know what's scary about being underwater with mummies? They can't breathe. They're already dead. So you know, it's even scarier. You know, I, I think it's great. I, there was a commercial on yesterday that showed Tom Cruise get those double irises too. Uh, that's the one thing I don't really understand. We're talking about what are the mummies? Are they spiders or what's what's with the double pupil ir irises thing? I don't know, but I like it. It looks fun. I love that you have enough life experience with this that you can say, you know what the scary thing is about being underwater with mummies? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, I like that too. I was like, that's true, man, because all they have to do is wait you out. They just have to scare you and just hold you there and be like, yeah, man, we got time. Um, no, I thought it was interesting. I feel like the first trailer got me more interested. This one, I'm like, I, I kind of saw what I expected to see in the movie. Like, there's lots of sand, a lot of, you know, I, the, the, the double peoples again. That was, a, that was a cool touch. I like her, like you said. I think she's great, so I'm interested to see where they go. I'm more interested with Tom Cruise, more than anything, because, I mean... We don't know why. I mean, she, so she's killing people. She's kind of a, an asshole. And so they're like, well, we'll just bury her in the ground. And so I was like, 
did, did you not just, I don't know, I would have just killed her. So you have to think she was already immortal somehow. Maybe Tom Cruise or some descendant of hers or something like that. Um, like the first trailer more than this second trailer, but Tom Cruise, I'm like, is he Dracula? Is he Wolfman? What is he in this whole thing? Because he's going to be something. I don't know. Intrigued. We'll see. I'm still on the fringe about the movie. I hope it's good because I like me some monsters. The, the Sophia Patel thing, though, is interesting because honestly, right now, I still don't know what to, to make of her. She obviously has great physicality in these movies. We go, mm. we're just right back to Kingsman. We can obviously see that. But she doesn't speak a lot in Kingsman. And what, what lines she does have are just like standard movie henchman lines. And then we see her in Star Trek, and that role was mostly physicality, so she was great in it, but I couldn't get a sense of her acting in it. Now I've seen two trailers recently with her in it. We've got uh, this one, and then we have, what's that one with Charlize Theron? Um, oh, right, the, the, uh, the, Platinum uh, Blonde. Platinum Blonde yeah. thing, where I don't think she speaks a word in either trailer. So it's I, half I, naked, though, with Charlie Smith. Well, yes, which right. has me intrigued, admittedly, admittedly. But all I'm saying is that I, nothing negative at all about Sophia Patel. I'm just saying right now, I still don't yet. I haven't got a big enough sample size right. of her actually acting right. to have an opinion about it yet, but I am really curious to see how she I, works out. I thought that in Star Trek Beyond, she actually w did act a, a bit. I think that the you know the, she had more of an emotional arc than I think a lot of the other characters in that movie. So, I mean, I, I do think, I think she's got the goods all the way around. I'm looking forward to seeing what she does. All right, what's next? Deadline is reporting that the architect and face of the Expendables franchise, Sylvester Stallone, has exited the Expendables 4 in both writing and starring capacities. This is reportedly due to disagreements with New Image and Millennium Chief Avi Lerner over the film's script, director, and certain qualitative elements of the film. Lerner spoke to Deadline, stressing that the Expendables 4 is not dead and has hopes that Stallone will return, but other sources for the outlet confirm that Stallone is in fact done with the project. Christian and thoughts on Sylvester Stallone leaving Expendables 4? Good. Uh, yeah, I, I look, I loved the first Expendables, and even the second one was a lot of fun. The third one, like, like even Sly says, that the PG 13 was a bad choice to, to do that. It, he doesn't need to do another one of these movies. I don't care how much he was going to get, he'll be okay <laughs> financially. He doesn't need to do an Expendables 4. Nobody's calling for that movie. It's, it's not going to do 60, 70, 80 million dollars. It's not. It's going to do like 30, 40 million dollars. No one cares anymore. It's becoming too, it's kind of like Ocean's 12 was. Um, and this is what look what Sly did. What Sylvester Stallone did with, with Creed. It's like he got himself back in the in the conversation as far as oh he can actually he can actually act again. Do Creed two. Do another Rambo movie other, besides Expendables. He doesn't need to do another Expendables movie. It was fun <laughs> while it lasted. I think get the hell out of there while you can. You don't need to do it. Yeah, who cares? Yeah. I, I mean, well, look, here's, here's I, I like you, I really, I like the first Expendables movie. I even like the second Expendables movie. There are things about the third Expendables Mel movie that were fun. Yeah. Mel, Mel certainly, actually, he was great in that. But I mean, realistically, let's look at this from, from just an objective point of view. First Expendables movie domestically makes $103 million. The second makes $85 million. The third makes $39 million. Are we sensing a pattern? People are not interested in this anymore, at least the way they were making them. Now, whether it's Sly's fault as the creative force behind it, or whether it was the studio's fault, I don't know, but at this point, it's just who cares? This was never a billion dollar franchise in the first place. This is totally fine that Sylvester moves on from this. It is gonna be interesting, like, he has been the creative engine behind this entire thing. Can you even move forward with Expendables? Like, it's, it's interesting to hear them say, Sylvester has left the project, almost insinuating that the project is still going to go on. How do you do Expendables without Sylvester Stallone? I just don't see how you do it at all. So I'm perfectly fine with this news. <clears throat> Sylvester seems, you're right, he's gotten a new life with everything he did with Creed. I want to see him do other things, so I'm perfectly fine with this. What do you think? Yeah, it's uh, the Expendables. What it was was this, this dream that boys in the 80s like myself had where we wanted to see Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger on screen together kicking ass like it was a Contra game or something like that. And then The Expendables was coming out. We didn't quite get Arnold because I believe he was still governor at the time, if I'm not mistaken. He just did one scene. Yeah, he did a scene where he comes in. and, and then You're he right, leaves. he was still governor. It, but in the second one, he wasn't. So we got a little more of that and we got Bruce Willis. The point is to have all these has-been action stars of yesteryear in the same movie together. And for Sylvester Stallone, make that work for you. He did that. He played that up. They played it up. Then, like you said, Sylvester Stallone had a bit of a resurgence. He's kind of no longer a has-been. This guy is an incredible source who was nominated for an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. So step out of Expendables. It worked for you there. Go do this. Springboard off of it. Make it work for you. So, hey, man, leave 
go on with your career, leave Expendables behind because your career going forward will probably be better than the Expendables franchise going forward for that. So, yeah, I'm glad he's gone. Sure. I wouldn't necessarily say that. I mean, what is that movie that he did with Schwarzenegger where they were locked up? Yeah, it was terrible. Uh, it was called Escape Plan. You know, I yeah. didn't think it was terrible. I, 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 well, the, my top he, ten list. He, right, he left Expendables four to go shoot Escape Plan Part Two. They're shooting that in Atlanta right now. So I don't, I don't see it as yeah. like him stepping up. It's more like stepping sideways. And I think you're right. There's absolutely zero demand for an Expendables four. Yeah. But would I see Expendables four if it was done better than Expendables three, which was like definitely a failure? And like I thought the best one so far was Expendables two. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and that actually had that flavor of exactly what you're talking about, where you're bringing all these weirdos. You have like Chuck Norris. Like where's the <laughs> dude from Jim Cotter? Some other flippy weirdo. I mean, <laughs> there's Cotter. so many other people that you have who are totally expendable who could show up in the Expendables four that you don't necessarily need. Uh, Stallone in there, he is the driving force though of Expendables 4, so if he's stepping away I agree with you, why even bother making it? So, Alright, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report. Fox and DreamWorks' The Boss Baby took the number one spot in its weekend in release bringing in an estimated $49 million at the box office. Finishing in the number two spot was Disney's Beauty and the Beast taking in $47.5 million as its domestic total climbs to $395.5 million after 17 days. Internationally, it added another $66.5 million, bringing the film's <laughs> global cum to over $875 million. At number three was the other new release, <laughs> Paramount's Ghost in the Shell, which brought in an estimated $19 million, well below industry expectations. Expectations. Lionsgate's Power Rangers finished in the number four spot with an estimated 14.5 million, dropping 64% in its second weekend. And rounding out the top five is WB and Legendary's Kong Skull Island. The movie pulled in 8.8 .8 million with its domestic total now at 147.8 million and 329.5 million international for a worldwide total approaching 500 million. Jeremy, were you surprised by the opening weekend for Ghost in the Shell? Uh, I, uh, yeah, I was surprised. I, I, it's one of those movies you see coming out, you don't know if it's going to totally crush in the box office. I didn't think it would. I think more people who are fans of the animation would have gone to see it. Uh, maybe they all did, and that's just how many fans you have out there that are willing to see a live-action adaptation. Uh, but you look at the reviews, the reviews were very on the fringe. Like eh, it's like Christian said in his review, like I, I mean, you're fine when you're watching it, but then afterwards, if you never see it again, the same thing. It's one of those things where if you're clean in house, you're like, I need something on Netflix. There you go. Sure. Uh, but that's not what they wanted. 19 million. I'm very sure. What do you think the expectation was? Like 50 above? 60? Oh, like, like six months ago as they were putting this yeah. thing together? Yeah, yeah. Probably 60 to 70. Right. So, so one third of what they were hoping it would get. Um, point is, it made... Le less than half of Boss Baby. So Boss Baby making about $50 million actually still surprises me. The whole weekend was very surprising. Um, I was locked into a vortex of, uh, of uh, going all in in Vegas, so it w I'm, I'm good. But, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually really surprised at Ghost in the Shell. Will we see another one? Probably not. You know, here's the funny thing. It, it comes along with the whole notion of the closed circle thinking. Closed circle thinking is basically this. Me and everybody in my circles, yeah. we all love Ghost, the original Ghost in the Shell. We all talk about it. Therefore, our thinking becomes, since me, everybody I know talks about it, everybody knows about mm -hmm. it and looks forward to it and wants it and simply not. I think what we saw here is a combination of two things. One, that the uh, assumption of how vastly popular just the Ghost in the Shell pro property is, or anime in general, is over-exaggerated because of those of closed circle thinking that people think because my social circle all talks about it, everybody does, and that is simply not the case. I don't think, I know, I've read some posts around the, oh, this is a, this was a backlash against whitewashing. This had nothing to do with whitewashing or anything like that. This was simply this. If you remember last week, they put out that five-minute clip, and one of the things I said at the time was, I love this five-minute clip because for the first time, it feels like a movie. Mm -hmm. All the marketing for Ghost of Shell up to that point felt like, Guys, come to see this abstract techno art exhibit we're going to put on in the movie theater. And that wasn't going to attract any average film goer whatsoever. That five minute clip they put out was the first time it felt to me this no, this is a tangible movie. This is a movie that I can go and see and enjoy if it's any good. And apparently it's not that good. I didn't bother going to see it because most people I know didn't like it. 
But I think what it comes down to is this is a great example of completely botched marketing. Because of the close circle thinking, I don't think this movie was ever going to be a $100 million opening weekend movie. It was never going to be that. But I think if they had a better marketing campaign, because I thought the trailers for these movies have, for the most part, been just confusing, seemed more trippy than anything else, and that just does not appeal to the average film goer. And they got turned off. They never bothered going out to see it. And you know they are not happy about this over at Paramount, uh, nor should they be. And uh, look, what does this mean for Akira? At this point, like, does a does a studio now at this point want to move ahead with with a project like Akira? I think that project's probably got the brakes put on. I, I don't. I'm not basing that on anything. I'm just making some guesses. What do you think? Well, as far as Akira goes, I don't know. Different studios. I think Warner Brothers is doing a, Akira, right? Yes, I think so. I mean. I don't know. I think that it's a matter of how the creative teams look at the stories. I, I, I tend to go away from when people go, well, because that anime project didn't do very well, then that one's not going to do very well because that's, you know, they could still make the same argument. It's like if comic books would have looked at that, well, that one comic movie didn't do very well, so let's not make comic Remember, movies. Warner Brothers is reactionary like that. Remember they, when, no, they are. When, when Watchmen didn't do as great as they wanted to, they pulled the plug in a couple of other movies. Totally. It is certainly comics. possible that they could look at it. I just hope that's not the case because I think with. I, I tell you that also, I think that Rupert Sanders might be a part of the problem also, too. Stylistically, the movie looked really cool, but the story was a bit. It was dull in its pacing. And like you mentioned, though, the thing is with this movie is that. A dark, strange movie like that, it, it doesn't appeal to mass audiences. A, a movie like that will never do big, huge box office. It won't. People always say, well, Blade Runner. Blade Runner didn't do very well in the theaters at all. It, it, built, it was a bomb. It, yeah, it was a bomb. It built momentum later on. And that's what this movie needed. It needed that word of mouth. It needed people just to mm -hmm. say, like, this is a really cool, strange movie. Go check it out. And nobody's saying that because for the most part, it's just like, eh, Boss Baby right now. The fact because there's nothing else out there mm -hmm. for kids to, kids to see. It's going to take a big hit next week with Smurfs. There's no doubt about it. Beauty and the Beast, though. I mean, you look at that, just still kind of... 877 million worldwide I, right now. It's got a very good shot at hitting a billion. It's starting to slow down a little bit, but it's got a good shot. It's definitely the most profitable movie, but that's that's the one that I'm still looking at. Like, man, that, that's that's something special that they have. What do you think, Shanam? Yeah, I mean, I'm impressed that Power Rangers is still sticking through there. I think you'll see another Power Rangers. I know they're talking about like making 12 of them oh, or something. Oh, I don't something. think so. You don't, you don't think, think so? We'll see a sequel? No. Look, it just dropped sixty-five percent in its second week. Sixty-five percent. But this at, was a yeah. movie that cost. Let me I'm just bringing it up again. This move. This is a movie that cost a hundred million dollars to make worldwide. Now, after two full full weeks, it hasn't even reached worldwide. Hasn't even reached ninety-seven million. Mm. Uh, and with a sixty-five percent drop, and you know that's going to drop to about five million next week. And uh, which is unfortunate because I actually think it's a good movie. I call it, I, I shock. I, I thought it was a fun movie. I think they could turn yeah. a, they'll, it's Saban. He'll turn around a sequel for like six bucks, you know? <laughs> and then you're going to see what happened the first time exactly. they put out a sequel. But you will see a sequel. I mean, my biggest disappointment, I am echoing everyone here, is Ghost in the Shell. And I, I agree with what you said. I think it's horribly directed. And when you make a movie, it's all about acting and reacting. And you have to have someone who knows how to get the performances out of the actors and actresses. And it is such a flat movie. Mm. You know what this reminded me of? That other big piece of shit, Snow White and the Huntsman, which is right. also directed. Yeah. It's like it's like I'm sleepwalking through a boring script. Which also and, looked cool. Yeah. And, and, right. Well, yeah. Right. 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 Ghost in the Shell looks beautiful. And right. I, I loved watching like this old man with like weird graphics on his face walking around the street. But that's not why I went to see Ghost in the Shell was some dude in the background with some bizarre graphics on his face. I wanted to see a cool adaptation of an amazing anime film that I saw 20 years ago. This is disappointing on so many levels. That's why nobody went to see it who saw the original film, because this film sucks. This film is like, they, they echo and repeat scenes from the original anime with none of the context, none of the texture, none of the storytelling prowess from 20 fucking years ago. It's embarrassing. That's what I think is wrong with it. It's a piece of shit. So you liked it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so overall, overall it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> Kong, uh, Kong is something interesting too. It's it's kind of hanging in there. It's on the bubble right now for as far as I think whether we consider Kong a success or not. Remember, it's close to a two hundred million dollar film to make right now worldwide, and it's it's pretty much finishing its run now. It's at four hundred seventy seven million, which normally sounds like a huge number. Right. It's not a huge number for. A almost two hundred million dollar film to produce. So, but it's it's close. So it's right there in the bubble. It's it's doubled as money. So it's so it's, it's when you take into account the the marketing. theater shares, marketing, all that kind of stuff. It's broken even. 
So we're, it's going to be really interesting to see how that follows up now. Did the audience like it enough that they're now going to go back in bigger numbers when Godzilla comes out? We're just going to have to wait and see. All right, folks, we reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Darren Aronofsky's latest film entitled Mother recently took over the release date vacated by Paramount's failed Friday the 13th reboot, <laughs> and it seems it's more to do with the Halloween season rather than because of a late awards push. As reported by The Wrap, Paramount's... <clears throat> Paramount domestic distribution chief Kyle Davies promised thrills and chills from Aronofsky's latest with a source close to the project confirming the director is working on a psycho horror movie in the same vein as the Natalie Portman-led Black Swan. The rap also provided a new synopsis for the movie which reads, A couple's relationship is tested when uninvited guests arrive at their home, disrupting their tranquil existence. Schnepp, do you buy or sell Darren Aronofsky's mother as a psycho horror movie? I buy it 100%. I can't wait to see another Aronofsky like lower budget black swan style film. This like this this is that kind of movie that was just gonna creep up on us, real silent style, and be like, what the hell? Yeah. But now it's like now we're a little we have a little clue. We're like, all right, dude, we know you're gonna make some weird psycho movie with Jennifer Lawrence called Mother. I can't wait to see it. So yeah, I'm really I buy it. Jeremy. Buy it too for all those reasons. Aronofsky, I think it's wheelhouse is like you give him less than like twenty million bucks and let him let him do his thing, let him get into the <laughs> psychological horror. Cause you give someone like that or really anyone a bigger budget they're they're more apt to be like well i want more special effects i want more bigger stuff it's not what why people watch his stuff i mean if you look at what was that noah it was called it was yeah. Noah, right yeah. it's i mean it was totally if you told me who directed this movie i would never be like darren aronofsky directed that film right not that i mean i enjoyed noah but i know this I know a couple of huge Aronofsky fans were like, I did not. And I totally get why they didn't, you know, because it, it's not why they go watch his stuff. Uh, psychological horror, low budget, really claustrophobic in a house. A absolutely. I'll buy that. I don't think there's anything you're not to buy about yeah. this. Black Swan was so freaking good. It was so creepy because every step of the way of that movie, you're like, OK, now what's going on? Right. But, yeah, but yeah. you never feel lost in it. Yeah. Then you, so you, you resolve and you move on to the next thing. Now what's going on here? And then it resolves. You move on. It was so well done. There's so much great tension and the the characters. You get into the characters so well. If he brings that same kind of sensibility to a movie like this, and he's got an actress like Jennifer Lawrence, much like he's worked with other actresses of that caliber with Natalie Portman before, this could be awesome. And I'm like you. I liked Noah. Mm -hmm. I had huge cheese potential going into that movie. Right. And it's like, oh, wow. This actually movie was Giant good. rock dudes talking yeah, and stuff. Cool, yeah, but it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so if he can bring something like that, I, I agree with you, Schnepp, completely. Bring him back to that lower budget work the atmosphere of it this could be great huge buy for me it's also a big buy for me and i think snaps just what we were talking about before with uh, ghost in the shell is that if you take the same premise and tell me that a lesser caliber director is doing it i don't care at all right but you then you put aronofsky's name on it and you start to tell me what it's about and then because of his past movies and the way he has worked in that style then i get excited and i also get excited because i think that jennifer lawrence is starting to catch a bad rap as where she's doing so much and you know whether or not she's in one or two movies a year she's always in oscar contention and she seems to be doing I, she was mailing it in for apocalypse yeah. we, all, we all agree on that but i think that a movie like this will challenge her a little bit more. A movie working with a guy like Aronofsky will challenge her more, and she's a very talented, one of the best actresses out there. To see her doing something like this will be good. So, yeah, everything about this I like so far. All right, what's next? According to Deadline, Universal Pictures has hired Aquaman screenwriter Will Beale to pen the script for their reboot of The Creature from the Black Lagoon. The iconic creature becomes the latest of the classic movie monsters Universal has lined up to join their rapidly expanding universe that launches this summer with The Mummy. Fast and Furious Chris Morgan and Transformers Alex Kurtzman are overseeing the monsters universe with another movie in the series yet to find a release date. John Byersell, Will Beale writing Creature from the Black Lagoon. I'm going to sell it for now with a little asterisk of ask me again after I see Aquaman. Because right now, the big thing on his resume is Mobster Squad. And Mobster Squad is, I'll be honest with you, one of the most disappointing films I have ever seen. Gangster Squad? Or Gangster, Gangster Squad. Squad. Don't you dare say that about Mobster, Mobster Squad. Squad. Sorry. How dare you, I, you know, I think I said Mobster Squad. Oh, yeah. Sorry. In fact, uh, actually, I want to see that Mobster movie. Squad. I was like, wait a minute, that sounds cool. <laughs> Mobster Squad? I, I Mobsters, don't know about that. who are also yeah. gangsters. Yeah. And I was sorry, Gangster Squad. <laughs> because I remember, Chef, you and I were doing those shows like early in those days. And it's oh, like, yeah. when Mobster, I keep saying, when I say Mobster, <laughs> when Gangster Squad 
was coming. We were freaking out. Yeah, the like, trailers were great. The trailers were awesome. Look at this cast. I'm a sucker for these era crime yeah. movies. This is going to be awesome. Yeah. And then we saw it. It's like, oh my God, what a load of Flatline. garbage. Yeah. And the script was terrible. Oh. And it, there was lots of blame to go around for that movie. But okay, he's working on Aquaman. We haven't heard anything but fairly positive stuff about Aquaman. So I'm going to sell it for now because I haven't seen Aquaman. But like I said, come back to me and ask me again after Aquaman 2 may change. What do you think? Yeah, it's a weird one because I was like, oh, you know, Gangster Squad. That's, it's, that's a hard one, too, to really kind of calibrate because remember, they had to reshoot the entire last half of the movie because of that shooting in the theaters. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that's a horrible thing. And that movie's forever going to be tainted because of you know, whatever they had to scramble and redo, rewrite, reshoot really quickly. So we don't really know what the full score was. But a movie, when you have to judge it just as, you know, outside of that kind of thing, it really kind of falls apart. Never really, none of the characters really mesh together no, too well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm hoping there's like four writers on Aquaman right now. Just like Kong Skull Island had like, like 95 writers. It had like four writers, too. So that kind of thing sometimes worries me. But, hey, look, Kong Skull Island... I got Kong fighting a bunch of cool monsters. That's really why I went to see the movie. Didn't I didn't care about the other characters really? It was really, they were the flatter than you could possibly make a pancake. It was like really, you know, I'm a photographer. Look, I'm in the I'm making photos. It was like get out of here. <laughs> Just show me the monster. So you know, I didn't go to see. I didn't care about any of the characters. So it was like, but as a you know, an action film with a bunch of monsters, Kong worked. Do we? Do I want that with Creature from the Black Lagoon? It's hard to tell because I haven't seen the Mummy yet. But I love the idea of them like putting together this giant universal monsters collective with a new refreshed take on it. I mean, cause everybody, you know, you can buy that universal collection of all the original monsters, James Whale's Bride of Frankenstein, Frankenstein, all these incredible movies from the forties and early fifties. And we're in 2017. It's about time we get some new monsters. Yeah. I'm cool with like a refreshed take on it. So that's all I really care about. I want it to be great. Jeremy. Yeah, it's uh, Black Lagoon and Aquaman. The guy either loves writing about water creatures or we're going to get another crossover. It's like the monster one and the, yeah. and the DC universe is now crossing over. I'm going to buy it with an asterisk that I want to see Aquaman for the, all the same reasons. It's just one of those things where you look at the guy's resume and really the one people know is Gangster Squad. So it's like he's done a thing out there. And like you were saying, there were a lot of reshoots and rethings that they had to do. I don't I, I feel like he deserves a mulligan. And in a world where he really has no real resume, I have right. no reason to go against him at this point. But fingers crossed for Aquaman. Fingers crossed for uh, Black Lagoon. We'll see how it goes. Do us proud. I'm going to buy it, and I'm also not going to fault him for Gangster Squad, which was one of the worst movies I'd seen in a, in a very long time. But I'm going to fault the director for that one, because that was directed terribly. And the writing wasn't the problem with that movie, because there are elements of that story that actually were pretty cool. Right. The, the way that the actors were directed, the way that, they, that just execution in general was a, an absolute catastrophe so but I'm not blaming him um, I think that this could be a lot of fun I also want to see how this monster universe in general shapes up before I, I necessarily I'm gonna get too excited about it I think the idea of the creature from the black lagoon is pretty cool yeah so um yeah so for those reasons I'll still buy it all right what's next Warner Brothers and Village Roadshow Pictures have released the final trailer for Guy Ritchie's King Arthur Legend of the Sword. Legend of the Sword stars Charlie Hunnam in the title role, with the film taking on the classic Excalibur myth, which traces Arthur's journey from the streets to the throne after his father is murdered by his uncle Vortigern, played by Jude Law. Jaiman Hansu and Aidan Gillen also stars with a release date set for May 12th. Christian Byers saw the final trailer for King Arthur Legend of the Sword. You know, I'm gonna buy it. I've I don't know that this might be the only one that I've bought out of all these trailers so far. And even though I didn't think that the Led Zeppelin song worked for the last trailer, it bothered me less this time. But I got a little bit more of an idea of what I'm gonna see throughout this entire movie. Um, and it doesn't seem to be over riddled with Guy Ritchie's style, which sometimes really works. But I don't necessarily need it for this movie. Um, I like to see a little bit of a blend and a mixture, and that's what I got in this trailer, as opposed to maybe just the overpowering that I got in the initial trailer. So I'm going to buy this one, although I still don't really care about this movie at all. Jeremy. Yeah, I'm buying it too, because uh, of the trailers we watched, this was the one that really fleshed it out for me. Like you said, you know what you're getting now, you know? Like, Excalibur is a magical sword in this movie, so it seems. You know, by definition, if there's only one guy who can pull a sword from a stone, it's magic. 
but this one, it, <laughs> yeah, it like, but it glows and it shatters other swords and, and elephants are, you know, I think it's every movie's goal to have an elephant bigger than the last movie that had a really big elephant. You know, you had like Lord of the Rings 300, you no know, King Arthur, you know, elephants just get bigger and bigger, but I, I'm buying it because I like the stylistic vision this time around in this trailer. I thought the song choice worked um, and it, What's that line that Jude Law has? Something like, when people fear you, it's the most intoxicating. Yeah. I'm like, that's a good line. I have heard that before. That's a something. great yeah. line, you yeah. know? So, I mean, it, it all worked together for me to be like, yeah, I'm buying this trailer. I'm actually looking forward to the movie for the first time. So, yeah. Schnapp. Yeah, I'm selling this trailer. I just can't get behind this new version of Arthur. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. No, I won't. I can't. <laughs> Giant elephants. They can't sell me on this thing. I mean, <laughs> it just... It's just flatlining for me. All the visuals. I mean, you know what I've got stuck in my head forever, which this will, any King Arthur movie will ever be compared to, is John Borman's Excalibur. Mm. And that film is such a great film, and I feel bad for anybody who ever takes on, at least for my dumb opinion, anybody who takes on the, the, the Merlin or Arthur or any, any of the, the, you know, the, t the Knights of the Round Table. It's like you're dealing with like some mythic characters, and you have to be able to show magic as well as uh, myth, as well as a little bit of reality, and this feels just too grounded for me. Every time they cut away to some kind of magic, I feel like it's like, that's a stupid lens flare, or it's an afterthought. They were like, oh, you better add magic. Throw a little fucking weird baboon in the sky or something, you know what I mean? I feel like it's an afterthought. It wasn't blended properly, so I still, I, maybe I'll be blown away and love this movie and be like crying about, like complaining about it, who knows? The first thing they teach you in film school is when you need magic, put a baboon in the <laughs> sky. <laughs> because then you know. I, I look. I don't know why, uh, but I'm gonna buy this trailer. I, I think it felt like it did feel very grounded, but also it did take feel a little otherworldly-ish. Whether it's the enormous size of the olifants, <laughs> at this point, or whether it's you know, the, I love the subtlety of the sword as well. Like when he grasps the sword, it's not like this sunburst of light encompassed the countryside. It was the little glow in the hilt. He draws the sword. People are like like what's going on and. That's that moment is what I think about when I think about the Excalibur story, but this was also the first trailer. Again, though, it might be a little too little too late, because this was the first trailer that gave me a sense of what this story is. This kid who moves on to this and this. And of course, we know the classic story, but if you're talking about just encapsulating this movie, I think it's the best trailer they put out so far. I quite enjoyed it. But the other ones have been divisive, and they've been confusing. And a lot of people, are, I think, justifiably show are thinking like Schnepp is thinking like this on right right now because the other trailers up to this point haven't really given you much as to here's a taste of the film and make it feel like a movie. And I think it might suffer opening weekend because of it. If they led with this trailer, if they started this campaign with this trailer a few months ago, we might be singing a different story. But look, the last movie guy Richie did was a movie I absolutely unabashedly loved, which is The Man from Uncle. Yeah. And I loved a lot of the films he's done, whether you go back to Lock, Stock, or Snatch, stuff like that. I love a lot of his films. So couple that in, I'm, I'm going to buy this thing. Yeah, I'm just, I think I'm just scared that I think in general, like this is a movie, even if it's done brilliantly, it's a tough movie to do for a summer release. Yeah. The way that yeah. the landscape is today, a King Arthur movie in summer, in general, if I'm a studio, I am hesitating greenlighting a movie like this and the trailers haven't been f great all the way around. Clearly, you know, it's, it's, it needs to be, for this movie to really work, there needs to be around the board, buy, 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 I can't wait to see this incitement needs to be through the roof. It's, it's not looking good. We've seen this happen before. It might get ghost in the shell. Yeah, uh, it's like all the really, same thing yeah. where the campaign's uh, slow leading up, and that one trailer's like, yeah, okay, I get it, but it might be too little too no, late. It, would we agree at this table of this is probably the best trailer they put out for this movie yeah. so yeah, far? Yeah, the best trailer yeah, so far. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But will it be enough? Right. No, will it be yeah. enough? That's the big question. All right, guys, I want to remind you that we do this show live, and when we do these shows live, we like to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take your live Twitter questions. You can start sending in your Twitter questions now. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter at Collider Video, start sending them in, and Wendy will pickle, pick Pickle. She'll pick a couple out at the end of the show. But I also want to remind you that this is not the only show on Collider Video today. A little bit later today, we have a brand new episode of Josh McCougan and his crew for TV Talk. Last night, the season finale of Walking Dead happened, so that means our Walking Dead recap show went up there as well. Also, don't forget, tomorrow... Star Wars Rogue One comes out on Blu-ray. We already have our Rogue One commentary 
online now on the front page of our YouTube channel. You can simply go there, or you can get it digitally right now and watch it. Just make sure you watch that movie right along with us, and because we had a good time watching it, and we think you will too. Uh, brand new Nightmares is coming this Wednesday with special guest director Guillermo del Toro is the special guest on Nightmares. That's on Wednesday. Make sure you check that out. And of course, a brand new episode of Awesome Tacular every single Friday dropped. And tomorrow, a very special uh, movie trivia showdown. We've got the rematch going on between Christian Harloff and Andy Signor from over there at Screen Junkies. You're going to want to check that out as well. All right, guys. We've reached now Mailbag. Look, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. So, Ashley, what's in the mailbag today? Andy writes, Greetings, Universal's Monsters Universe. And with the new Mummy trailer, I wonder if you guys think we'll see cameos of other monsters in the movie like Frankenstein, Dracula, or the Wolfman so they can set up the other movies. You all rock, and thanks for the great content. Well, I, I think the one thing that, that Schnepp really uh, sharply pointed out earlier is that Tom Cruise is probably going to end up being one of the new monsters in the movie, w whether it's because of the crash and what the mummy does to him, or maybe he was inherently born. Maybe he was Dracula and never knew this whole time. I, I, I don't know. We've already seen that we've got Russell Crowe in there as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I don't know how far they're going to go, but I have a feeling the third act of this film, I'm basing this on nothing, I'm just guessing, that the third act of this film may subtly introduce what the next movie will be. So to answer your question, yes, I think some kind of cameo will probably set up the larger universe. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, I think that was a really, really good point Schnett made earlier. It was like one of the <laughs> best I've ever heard. And what I, uh, seriously, it was one of the greatest, smartest, most genius point. And uh, it, it, I mean, bafflingly good. And uh, But uh, I agree with you that, um, and Schnepp, <laughs> that uh, w w we'll see a setup of some sort, and uh, it will be Tom Cruise is going to be something. Like he has to be something, you know. And if it's not him, then we're just going to see Frankenstein come into his bedroom and say, "We're here to talk to you about the Monsters Initiative." <laughs> it's going to be that. But it's going to wait for the post-credit scene, folks. Something's got to happen. Um, like I said before, I think he could possibly play the Wolfman. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but I think I do think that there will be cameos. Absolutely. For sure, I think that uh, Russell Crowe, even for the most part, even this is a little bit more of a glorified cameo. He's going right. to have his own thing. I think that that's exactly how they're going to do it. They're going to set it up. They'll put little hints, very similar to what they did in maybe um, Winter Soldier when they mentioned Stephen Strange. <laughs> they can right, right. mention right. somebody, and then that kind of can link through it. I think that they should do that. Schnepp, what did you think about what Schnepp said earlier about, uh, about this movie? I totally disagree with what Schnepp said earlier. <laughs> Screw that guy. He's too stupid to talk. But you know what I think? Um, you know, I'd love to see Tom Cruise either be Van Helsing or oh. Dracula. I mean, one of the two, because... Yeah. They Have wanted... we heard them say his name in a trailer yet? No, no. but they've given him some name, but I don't believe that's going to be his real name. So I agree that, you know, because Tom Cruise signed on to not just do The Mummy, but to be, like, sort of the figurehead of this entire new Universal monster. So he has to either be Van Helsing or Dracula. Any of the other characters, I don't think... he's. They're not going to do a Wolfman with Benicio Del Toro and, right. you know, fighting his goofy dad at the end. Screw that movie. They, so many of these movies, these remakes of the Universal Monsters have just been horrible. Just bad. So I have a lot of hopes for this mummy being really good. I want the creature from the Black Lagoon. I want Johnny Depp's Invisible Man to not suck. You know what I mean? Yeah, There's like yeah. all these... Javier Bardem is going to play Dr. Frankenstein in the Frankenstein movie. It's like they've got a lot of amazing actors and they're getting a lot of talent together. So I'm hoping that they're able to do, like you said, the last 30 minutes, maybe st stick a creature in there, but not take over. This is the Mummy yeah, yeah, movie. Yeah. It's got to be centered around the Mummy, but they'll definitely pepper in. You already got Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde showing up, you know, yeah. so... All right, guys, so I said we save a little bit of time for your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Fire in some questions. Wendy, what have you picked out? All right, this first one comes from Maya Patton, who writes, What do you think of the Hayden Christensen meet and greet selling out faster than anyone in the history of Celebration? Wow, I didn't know that. Well, well okay, there's, <laughs> there's a couple of asterisks to put in place there. Remember, everything else had already been sold out. I mean, everything else, all the other tickets and passes and things you get for all those special events had were already done and online. And for a lot, I know a lot of my friends are trying to buy tickets for a number of the people who are going to be there, and they're already sold out. So then it comes this one extra thing, and so everybody buys the tickets. So, so that's, that's great. The big question for me is, does Hayden Christensen being at Celebration... Is that the harbinger of basically acknowledging 
that Hayden is back in episode eight or nine uh, as either a flashback or as a Anakin Skywalker force ghost. Because as Christian pointed out so sharply the other day that, remember, whether we like it or not, the way canon is now, it's the Hayden Christensen force ghost that shows up at the end of Return of the Jedi. So that is what is now canon. So I'm going to pose this question to you guys at the table. I'll start with you, Christian. Does Hayden, being at episode eight, pretty much at least bolster the theory that Hayden is going to pop up in either episode eight or episode nine? Or is it just coincidence that he just happens to be going this year? No, it doesn't mean it at all. And, and it's funny because we had the WonderCon panel yesterday, and that was a question I got the most yesterday out of anything when we got off stage. Um, no, it, it doesn't because don't forget... It is the 40th year anniversary of Star Wars. So Dennis Lawson, who played Wedge, is going to be there, and not as big of a name, obviously, as, as Hayden Christensen, but Dennis Lawson has never done any Star Wars con ever. And it's and I think George Lucas is going to show up. I think there's going to be a lot of stuff that happens on that first night to really kick it off where you're going to see these special guests. And I still <laughs> believe, by the way, that Hayden Christensen is indeed in Episode Eight, and I think that he will be doing a Force Ghost. But I don't think it will be announced there. I don't think that they're going to necessarily means that he's going to be. I think that he's going to be there for the 40th year anniversary. I think Ewan McGregor will be there. I think there's going to be a lot of people there that are going to be um, announced, the people that you probably didn't know. But announcing him, they knew they're going to get those questions. They knew that that was going to be like, oh, wait a minute. Does, what does that mean? So I don't think it necessarily means it's a guarantee because remember the 40 year. Ian McDiarmid's going to be there. That doesn't necessarily mean the Emperor is going to pop right. up, I guess. And Schnepp, what do you think? Do you think Hayden's going to, him being at this thing is going to mean he's popping up in the movie? I was just more excited that Wedge Antilles is actually going to be yeah. showing up. Wedge! <laughs> um, yeah, Hayden. Uh, you know, I, the only thing I thought is maybe they're going to like do a, like a spin-off, uh, you know, a Darth Vader one-shot. Which, you know, if they were going to do a one-shot with Darth Vader that takes place between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. But why put him in this suit? You know, right. I don't know because yeah. you know, he's Darth Vader now. I mean, it's like they can't obviously yeah. they can't go back to any of the other older Darth Vaders. Mm -hmm. It's well, like, well, I don't yeah. think it was him in the suit in Rogue One. No, no, it wasn't. Not. It was a, like a wrestler, like a, a ex wrestler. I think oh, I really? can't remember. I, yeah, some like six foot five guy. I think that they were going to do any spinoff, which I don't think they're going to do. They'd probably do a Clone Wars Anakin to where he was still good. But I don't think it's ever going to happen. What do you think? Yeah, I, my uh, wedge, my mind went right to wedge. I was like, yeah, I think they're all just kind of coming together. I will say this, though. And the more I think about it, the more th this, this, I would be okay with a Hayden Christensen, Christensen force ghost in the sense that I don't think he's a bad actor. I just think he was hamstrung yeah. from the beginning with a bad script and a, a director who was kind of phoning it in at that point. If he is in it and he pulls it off and does well, that would give me personally a sense of closure. So if they can pull it off, I would be fine with it, but only if they could pull it off. All right, what's next? This next one comes from Brian Cruz, who writes... Will it be the highest grossing horror movie of all time? The trailer broke the first day views record with 200 million. I'm going to say no, but I think it has the opportunity. That trailer was great. Mm. It was, and, and much like a lot of these other properties, it's, it's one that I've been questionable about. Okay, uh, there could be some good, there could be some bad. That trailer was awesome. Mm. And that poster was awesome. I think that trailer and the poster... Take Special Note Studios, lead with your best trailer. Lead <laughs> with your best trailer. Because I think that trailer has guaranteed a certain box office return on opening weekend. Do sure. so I think it's going to be the all-time? At this point, I'm going to say no. But I think it's definitely going to be strong. What do you think, Schnapp? I think that, move, that movie's going to make some crazy money. I mean, because when I saw that first picture of the dumb clown, I was like, he looks stupid. He looks dumb and un, un, unscary. I laughed when I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I remember. There was, I wasn't laughing while I was watching that trailer. <laughs> mm. There's no laughter coming out of my little baby mouth. Like, oh, the weird, ah, crazy clown running at the end. The weird, that little like slide projector malfunction. What a great trailer i think that's one of the greatest trailers that's come out this year for a horror film for sure might be one of the greatest all-time horror trailers i've ever seen it just it really captures this feeling of dread and horror mm. that that it is supposed to have and you know i mean you can go back and watch the tim curry it it's not a scary movie that it's a made for tv you know series it's not that scary the clown is creepy looking in photos and stuff but he's yet you know, we all float it's he's not that scary he's scary looking but this actually had that horror element to it, which 
I cannot wait to see. So yeah, I think it's going to make some big money. See, as somebody who played a lot of road hockey and yeah, grew up in Canada, many, many a times the tennis ball would go down into the sewer. <laughs> and many, many times we had to go to sewer and kind of look down. That one shot in that trailer where the kid's looking into the sewer and that clown face comes out. I'm like, I remember Natasha Martinez was watching it in here. And Natasha was like, nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. I don't know, Jeremy. What, what do you, how do you think this movie's going to do? I think of the 20 million or so hits that the trailer's gotten, 50% of that is from me, so you're welcome. It. I've seen that trailer so I've seen it a lot, and I usually go right to that uh, slide projector malfunction because just visually, that is some great mm. visual horror. The way it moves so fast, it's actually moving, and the hair is like moving back, yeah. and he's just grinning. I, it's fantastic. It's a great trailer. I'm with, uh, I'm with you in the sense that uh, I, the old one, I, I thought it was cheesy, and it never scared me. It just <laughs> never did. So this one put it on a new, a new spectrum for me. Looking forward to it. All-time horror, I need to know what the all-time horror right now is in order to quantify that number. But for right now, I'm going to say hopefully it makes a lot of cash because I think it, so far, based on this trailer, totally deserves it. Would it be The Conjuring? Is that the all-time like biggest opening? I th biggest, I think it might be. Uh, Conjuring, I was going to say, I think it was the one. But I also think the thing is, for the majority of trailers that have had this kind of meteor meteoric uh, rise, what, the only one that I can think of that didn't deliver off box office afterwards was Fifty Shades of Grey, whatever the, la whatever the last one was. Darker. Darker. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, that one didn't deliver in the way we, we thought it would because it just did so well. But Beauty and the Beast certainly mm -hmm. did very well. Star Wars, we know, did very well. Um, so I do think this one is going to do really well. Does it have the chance to be the all-time? I actually think it does. I think that there's a certain buzz around this movie that it's going to get people who, I mean, myself and Dennis, as you guys know, not, not the guys who are normally looking forward to horror movies, but even the two of us were like, this looks pretty cool. I want to see it. I think it's going to get all audiences because it looks like a good movie. It doesn't just look like a good horror thriller, which it certainly is. It looks like a good movie. All right, so just looking up some information here. Now, if you take Sixth Sense out, because mm. that's not really a horror yeah, film. It's that's a supernatural a thing, film, but yeah. The Exorcist, all right? The Exorcist right now is the one to beat, and I don't know that it can beat it. Yeah. Uh, the Exorcist has $232 million domestically, $445 million, or $441 million worldwide. Is that adjusted? Uh, I do not believe it is adjusted. Wow. So that's a big number for any movie. I don't know if it can hit that, but it doesn't need to hit that to be incredibly yeah, successful. Right. All right, what's next? This next one comes from Nathan G. Ainsley, who writes, Do you think that if DC didn't start the DCEU, could Nolan have made a fourth Batman? And if so, would you have preferred it? Um, okay, could he have? Yeah. Yes. Would he have? No. Christopher Nolan was pretty definitive when that third film came out that I'm done. He has other films he wanted to do. He did his Batman run. He did a great job with Batman, but he was done and he was going to move on. So could he have? Yes, absolutely. Warner Brothers would have laid out the yellow brick road for him to come back and do it. They would have offered him the world, but he he was pretty convincing. It's not like one of these guys just, oh, I'm when every you know six months when Quentin Tarantino says, this next movie is my last movie. It's not like that. Christopher Nolan was really convincing when he said, I... I'm yeah. wrapping up my Dark Knight. I am done. I'm moving on. And, you know, he served as, as an executive producer on Man of Steel. And I thought that movie was great. Everybody knows that. But I, I really do think he had his fill with it. I, and, and I remember when we were still with AMC, we sent uh, one of our people down to New York for uh, the Dark Knight. Was it Rises? Was that the third Dark one? Dark Knight Rises, yeah. Um, and we talked to him on the red carpet. And we asked, more comic book movies? And he said to us, no, I don't think so. I don't think I think he's done with the comic book genre, so I don't think it would have happened. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, there's a difference between could and would. That's for that's for sure. But no, I prefer where we're going now. I mean, the DCEU does have its problems, and they are obviously trying to fix them. But the only thing, not the only thing, but a thing that's worse than a cinematic universe that does have its problems is a trilogy that has a fourth installment that's forced. So, no, I prefer what we have. I wouldn't want Nolan to have a gun to his head and make a fourth movie. He's like, eh, I guess that'll happen there. That would have been horrendous. So I'm glad we are where we are, comparatively speaking. Yeah, I'm with Jeremy on this one. I think that he would have... Uh, I think he, he arced it out to where it, there was a clear ending for his trilogy the way that he wanted, and it would just been kind of push. And he's also shown that he wants to do a lot more, whether it's Dunkirk or a movie like Inception. I mean, he wants to do... Or Interstellar. He wants to do different type of movies so he was locked into telling the story of Batman because he had a 
clear story he wanted to tell in those three movies. <laughs> and some people, I actually really liked the last one. I know a lot of people think that it is the weakest uh, uh, of the three, and and some people might even have the argument, well, it started to kind of go downhill after The Dark Knight anyway, and it might have just went worse after that. So I, And I also don't think that it's just something, back then, the, the, the cinematic universe wasn't really a thing. It was just about, it was very similar to what, like Tim Burton had his the way that he wanted to tell movies. Nolan wanted a way he was going to tell his movies, and that was it. You make three movies and you're done. Now there's just too much involved. I don't think he wants any part of that. Wanted any part of that. Schnapp. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't think he was ever. His intention was even after Heath Ledger's unfortunate passing. I don't think he wanted to make the second one. I mean, the third one. I mean, because he was originally Riddler was going to be in there. There's all these other things that he had planned on doing with the third movie, but then because of the untimely death of Heath Ledger, he had to change everything and throw. You know, it kind of ruined a lot of stuff. For myself, I love the the second movie the most, The Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. The third movie works in a certain sense of like closing out a trilogy, but. Nolan's done. I'm looking forward to Matt Reeves' trilogy. That's what I'm looking forward to. I, I want to see the newer version, the mm -hmm. reset, rebooted DC after these <laughs> first couple movies, you know, do their thing. And I've got an incredible theory. Tune into Heroes tomorrow to oh. listen to my <laughs> DC <laughs> Universe reset theory because I think I'm right. That's called a tease plug right there. Uh, all right, let's uh, do the last question of the day. Okay, last one comes from Adam Nowakowski who writes... With the first quarter of 2017 already behind us, what has been your favorite and least favorite movie so far? Oh, oh, oh okay. See, that's uh, that's oh. horrible because uh, that means I have to remember oh, off the top of my head I'm what prepared. have I seen the last few months. Okay, so I'm just going to... Oh, well, for me, easy. The best movie of the year so far for me has been Logan. Uh, mm. That just was... That movie is just a triumph on so many levels as the comic fan in me loved it. The action movie fan in me loved it. The film fan in me loved it. So that's probably the best. I loved uh, John Wick Chapter 2. The most pleasant surprise movie for me has been Power Rangers. I mean, obviously, The Great Wall was a triumph. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so the, I, that's the... Man, I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, actually, the Belco experiment. I got a kick out of the Belco experiment. I started hearing some people saying they didn't like it, but I actually got a big kick out of that movie. I don't, what What about you? What are some of the ones that stand up to you? I think I stand with you with, with Logan, and I put the Lego Batman movie in there also right now. Um, I also think Get Out could be up there for a, a surprise movie, and I think that... Um, I don't know. Worst, I'd probably say we were just talking about it beforehand. Great Wall was pretty <laughs> stupid. Um, so that one, the Resident Evil movie needs to go away and never come back. Sorry, Schnepp. Um But that's it. Oh, and how could I? Uh, worst, sorry. Oh no. Worst movie oh, of the oh, year. Oh, 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 oh. I want to okay, guess. I'll let you do it. Oh, oh, Fifty Shades is unwatchable. Yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's watchable. It's funny. <laughs> oh, it's it, it, it unwatchable. Is, it, it's unwatchable. Though, that helicopter scene. It, it, it's kind of <laughs> like if you have a doctor who's doing a procedure like under your toenail and you have no, but he's doing something funny or like you're doing funny stuff, but that's really painful. Uh -huh. You know, like you can't. You can't quite, the, the funny does not outweigh the horrendous script we sat there. Right when you said, how can I? I was like, don't take this from me. John, thank you for letting <laughs> me have it. But I do, I emulate you on Logan. I, I'm, I'm miming you right there. It, it's uh, of all, all facets, all aspects of it. Loved it all and loved it more the second time, which is rare in, in the movie world. I'll say for, for myself, I love the movie <laughs> Raw, which is a, it's a small right, release yeah, yeah, film, yeah. but... It's a really, a really good film. It's a great double feature to see with Get Out if you want to see like a really cool, like extended, you know, creep show style anthology. Like two really good movies mm -hmm. that could be part of the same universe. Um, as far as uh, Logan, I have to agree with you. I think that was such an emotionally moving film. It was, it went above and beyond the superhero genre and transformed yeah. mainly because of the performance of Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart and uh, James Mangold. He did, he. He did a, a great return to greatness after, like, I didn't like the Wolverine. So I felt like I think he corrected whatever faults that he that he had with those characters and really delivered, what, I think, an amazing film, not just a superhero movie. And I got to say, Lego Batman was probably the most enjoyable film that I've seen all year so far. Just from beginning to end, I was laughing the entire time. What a fun film. But the thing with Fifty Shades, of, here's the thing with Fifty Shades, though. Like, the first one... It wasn't a good movie. The first one was not a good movie, but it's it's like it wasn't one of the. It wasn't so epically bad that you're going to write songs about it about how epically bad it is. This was one of the. I question whether an actual <laughs> studio was behind it. <laughs> like this, this was this movie was so incredibly bad. From the writing was horrendous. The directing was awful. I mean, everything about this movie was so. 
I was going to say something. I'll, no, I'll just say it was so bad that it, it's, it just makes you wonder who, who, like, did any of these people who made this movie ever work a day in film? <laughs> like, it's just that bad. <laughs> now, coming a distant second, though, to that would probably be Chips. Oh, yeah. uh, not close second, a distant second, yeah. but after that would probably be Chips. It's, it's also pretty damn horrendous. But I'm just curious, Wendy, let me ask you this. Favorite movie of the year so far, worst movie of the year so far? Well, you guys all picked Logan, so I want to give a little love to Get Out uh, for, oh, yeah. Get for favorite. Great. I really, really thoroughly enjoy that movie. Um, by Jordan Peele, and then worst, it's got to be, it's it's so bad, Fifty Shades was so bad that I forgot that I saw it until <laughs> I, I was reading the chat, and I was like, oh, yeah. Um, but it was the most fun I've ever had at a, at a screening with everybody. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> what about you, Ashley? I actually have the same as Wendy. I loved Get Out so, so yes. much. After I saw it, I, every single person I saw, I was like, have you seen Get Out? You have to see Get Out. Rarely ever do I love a horror movie that can make me laugh at the same time. I, for some reason, I don't enjoy that, but this had that perfect balance of everything and it scared me at the same time with 50 shades i went into this movie thinking oh these guys they're not going to give 50 shades a fair chance like i'm excited for this movie dang was <laughs> i surprised as to how terrible it was i i cannot believe that what a letdown that was <laughs> that was just awful all right guys that'll do it for us for this installment of movie talk do me a favor jump into the comment section and let us know what you think. What to you were the best movies of the year so far? Give us your top one or two. And what do you think were the worst movies of the year so far? Give us your bottom one or two. We'd be interested to see what you guys have to say. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, over there, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? Find me on Instagram and Twitter, just at John Schnepp. And Heroes Tomorrow, live, 1 p.m. Come and check it out. It's going to be fun. Right beside me, Mr. Jeremy Johns. Looking forward to your uh, your DCEU theory, Mr. Schnepp. I think I know what it is. <laughs> I, think, I think I do. Uh, you can find me at Jeremy Johns on uh, YouTube, Twitter, the rest of the internet. You can find my show, Awesome Tacular, on uh, the Go90 network. It's fun. Schnepp and I do some comic book funness. So Harloff and I talk some Star Wars. We play some fun games. It's The, the key word here is uh, uh, fun and Awesome Tacular. <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> right beside me, Christian Harloff. Well, what's also awesome, Tackler, is to watch this man over here compete in the inner geekdom, which went up on Friday. It was all the geeky oh, subjects yeah. on the Movie Trivia Showdown. Check that out. Uh, Christian Harloff on Twitter and Instagram. And Signor, I'm coming for you, buddy. Going to avenge that loss. We got Ashley Mova. I also forgot to say I loved Split 2. You guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Split Ashley two. Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And Wendy Lee. On YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you guys can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter just at John Campia. That'll do it for us today, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.